Hi, I'm Scott Lewis, and I've been involved with sound and lighting design for theater, concerts, professional speakers, business events, and other uses for over 30 years. I've also operated a recording studio in my home, and I'm a filmmaker, videographer, photographer, and marketer, and I use a lot of audio and video in my marketing. Today, we're going to have a short course on audio for video basics. We're going to cover some audio fundamentals and some audio for video principles. We'll talk about microphone characteristics and selection, non-microphone sources, camera settings, cables and cable management, testing your gear, detecting and fixing common audio problems, and why prevention is much better than fixing it in post. We're going to talk about some Final Cut Pro 10 specific information, a little bit of ear training, how to visualize sound to combine hearing and seeing when diagnosing or fixing or enhancing audio, a few tips and tricks, and a wrap up for any final questions along with of some practice scenarios that you can use to review what we've learned together. Let's start with some fundamentals. To set a common foundation, here are some fundamental audio terms. Pitch is the frequency of a sound. Many sounds we deal with are made up of more than one pitch, but being able to recognize the approximate frequency of a sound can be very helpful when trying to find and fix a problem or make an enhancement for a specific purpose. Timbre is the quality or character of a sound. A piano, violin, drum, and dog bark can all be at the same frequency, but they don't have the same timbre. Dynamics are the variations in the volume of a sound, and dynamic range refers to the range from the softest to the loudest sound captured or reproduced. There's more life in music with a wide dynamic range, but more apparent loudness in music that has had dynamic range compressed out of it. Source refers to where the sound comes from. There are intentional sources, desired sources, and unintentional but unavoidable sources, in some cases, such as room noise. We'll talk more about room noise later. Some sources are captured during live production, while others may be added or substituted in post-production. Noise has sources too, but in this conversation, we treat noise as the sound that comes from something other than our intended sources. Reverberation, or reverb, is reflected sound. Reverb has delay and decay characteristics that provide an audible cue to the size and surface characteristics of the space the source is in. Audio reverb should fit the visual space shown in the video. Since volume has a logarithmic relationship to distance and sound travels at approximately 1100 feet per second, decay and time are used to characterize reverb. You'll see references to RT60 time in audio literature. In this case, decay time is the time it takes for reverb to fall to 60 dB below the source volume. Reversing this logic explains why reverb suggests space. The delay part, or the echo, is how long it takes for the first reflection to get back to our ears. And the decay part is how long it takes for the sound to fall 60 dB below the initial volume. Amplitude, or volume, is the magnitude of the sound wave, or how loud it sounds. Phase is the difference in timing between two waves, such as one source when it arrives at a pair of stereo microphones at slightly different times. Two signals that are in phase will add together and be louder. Two signals that are out of phase will cancel each other out. Since different frequencies arrive at different times, this is a matter of sound quality, not just sound volume. We measure sound pressure in units called decibels. There are several decibel scales based on voltage, peak volt values, and root mean square or RMS values. For this class, it doesn't matter what scale we're talking about that much as long as the values are relative to each other. SNR, or signal-to-noise ratio, is inherent in your equipment, but is further applicable to noise sources outside the equipment. Ideally, there will be a very large signal-to-noise ratio in the equipment so that our sources will sound great while the noise floor of the signal chain is not audible. The external noise, on the other hand, may or may not be a desirable part of the soundscape, so the signal-to-noise ratio for room or environment noise is a bit more of an artistic and practical matter. We can't always control it. Most people have heard distorted sound. While distortion can be used to good effect on a lead guitar, it is not something we want to add in the recording path. 
Distortion in the digital domain is especially bad as it doesn't add a nice warmth or crunch, it just breaks up and can't be recovered. Recording as strong a signal as possible while leaving some headroom to avoid distortion is the balancing act of good audio for video. There are tools such as compressors and limiters that can help us get a strong signal while avoiding distortion. Just to get us in the ballpark, here are some interesting ways to refer to different frequencies. This is a chart I borrowed from warbeats.com. When an audio engineer adds air to a track or in mastering, they are boosting EQ at the high end of the audible spectrum. Be very aware that frequency response and room characteristics impact how we perceive relative volumes across frequencies. If you're putting the finishing touches on a music video and want to make sure the bass moves the audience, check it on headphones, earbuds, tablet speakers, television, car stereo, home theater speakers, and on any other device you expect your audience to experience it from. What shakes the room on the home theater could be a pile of rumble and mud that ruins the sound on another device. Or what sounded great on headphones or small speakers might be overwhelming on large speakers. Keep this chart in mind when trying to locate and adjust a problem frequency in a track in your project. Next we'll go over some audio for video principles that will help your productions. When we cut live, we don't want to have to go back and fix things in post. We're trying to get the production captured as we mix it during the live event to avoid having to spend an equal amount of time or longer in post-production editing our, our production. Getting the audio right becomes even more important in live cut productions, sort of. Even if we do intend to do post-production editing, we don't really want to have to spend a lot of our time fixing basic, avoidable audio problems, and many problems can't be effectively fixed in post. So actually, regardless of production plan, get it as right as you can the first time, when it's captured. When thinking about audio for video, consider dialogue, music, effects, and ambiance such as room tone. You might manipulate these in relation to each other, but you need to do so consciously. When a golf announcer in a production trailer in the parking lot whispers, he or she does so because whispering is expected in golf. If he or she is experienced and well-directed, that whisper will be a pretty loud whisper so that a great audio track is broadcast or captured, and it'll play at a volume louder than a whisper on air, but it will still be perceived as a whisper. We're going to talk a lot about microphones in a moment. Picking the right microphone and placing it properly goes a long way towards getting usable audio. Placement needs to consider whether the microphone can be seen on camera, as well as optimum audio capture. If the microphone is far from the recording device, it's important to use a balanced cable to try to reduce stray electrical noise and the adverse effects from the impedance of the cable on frequency response. Low impedance cables are typically the ones with the 3-pin XLR connectors on them. Take the time to set the gain properly and to manage levels during capture if necessary. Check other settings such as EQ, compression, and limiting in the capture device. Should use these to avoid problems, but save any effects or enhancements for post production if this isn't a live cut. You don't usually have the listening environment in the field to make precise adjustments for warming or sweetening a voice, for example. Have you been tempted to use that Sports Stadium virtual studio uh, set in the TriCaster? Well, have you thought about what background noise would be appropriate in that setting? Background noise should match what the viewer sees without becoming a problem on its own. It should not come and go with different sources or with voiceover added in post. Off-screen sound can provide important cues and premonitions or it can ruin a scene. Know what should be heard and make sure that the audio makes sense. Off-screen sound, for example, could be footsteps coming down a hallway that you can't see. Uh, Off-screen sound is particularly useful in horror movies to uh, create a sense of impending doom, but it can be used in many, many settings. Two things are true of us videographers. We use wireless more than we should, and we use a lot of batteries. Wireless is easier because there are fewer cables, and wireless is cheaper because there is no boom operator to pay. But wireless has more noise, less dynamic range, the potential for interference, and, like a handheld camera, the potential for the batteries to run out at the wrong time. Plan accordingly. It's pretty tempting to take a feed from the mixing board in a live event. Just remember that the mix on the board is for the live audience in the live room. You want a mix that works for video. 
If you can, take a pre-effects feed, or capture each channel separately better yet, or get an auxiliary mix that was made just for video, or maybe it's a mix that the engineer has created for recording the event instead of the live sound in the room. You don't want to be on the same output bus as the uh, PA in the room because when there's feedback or another problem or an event organizer says it's not loud enough and the engineer starts making changes to the volume in the room or tries to react to feedback, it's going to ruin your audio. Equalization, compression, limiters, and other controls can solve or avoid problems in production and post-production. Take the time to learn the tools and apply them carefully. We'll talk more about several tools later in a post-production context. Now, none of this is any good if it doesn't work as planned. So have a production plan. Test, test, and test again, both equipment and plan. A bad cable, a failed battery, a missed setting, or a bad feed can be a most disappointing surprise after the production. Now we're going to get into some rules of thumb. The first is a somewhat of a personal one. I have a preference for redundancy. I like to capture audio in camera and on a separate recorder. I shoot a lot of digital SLR video, and digital SLRs are notorious for audio problems like capturing the sound of a lens autofocusing and for less than impressive mic preamps. I use an external recorder to have a second recording both for redundancy and for better quality. I still capture the sound in the camera so that I can synchronize those two audio sources later on. Try to set gain and levels so the audio generally peaks in the minus 12 to minus 6 dB range. And make sure it never goes over 0 dB. A minor over 0 peak added warmth in the analog days. In digital, it equals distortion and lost information. Compression or limiting can be a powerful tool for getting good average levels without going over 0, but be careful not to introduce new sonic anomalies with overzealous use of these tools. Your final mix should peak at minus 6 to minus 3 dB, with the music bed sitting at minus 18 dB or so, and sound effects generally sitting in the minus 18 to minus 12 dB range. Now, these are rules of thumb, and they're meant to be broken, but I want you to know what a starting point to aim for is. Also, depending on the use of our final video, these levels may or may not be appropriate for the final uh, use. So you may have to turn them down in mastering, for example, if you need to have a certain maximum volume for, your, for broadcast purposes, for example. Don't forget to capture some room tone in case you need to put it under voiceovers in post. When capturing room tone, clear the set or room, or at least call for quiet on the set, and pay attention to extraneous noise which will sound odd if it repeats when you loop room tone in post. Capture a long enough clip to minimize the sound of repetitive anomalies in a looped clip, and try to avoid the anomalies. Listen to make sure you're getting what you think you are getting. Headphones are almost as important a tool as microphones, even though we sometimes have to juggle headphones with intercoms on our heads in our television productions. So let's talk about microphones. In most cases, our audio signal chain starts with a microphone. We're going to talk about types of microphones, their characteristics, placement of microphones, and handling. There are many microphone pickup patterns and many types of microphones. You can see three polar patterns here. Note that frequency matters in the polar patterns. Bass is less directional than high frequencies. So omnidirectional microphones are good for picking up from all directions, and they have little to no proximity effect. Cardioid microphones and hypercardioid microphones are increasingly directional and have a more pronounced proximity effect, along with more frequency-dependent off-axis response curves. And you can see in the polar patterns here, the one that looks most circular is an omnidirectional microphone, but it's very omnidirectional for low frequencies and mostly omnidirectional for higher frequencies. Also, in its frequency response chart, you can see it's a very flat line until it falls off at the very top end, and there's a very very small boost in the high frequencies, um, but it's pretty flat. Whereas with the cardioid and the hypercardioid, you see more rejection from the sides and rear, uh, and you also see, though, that there's more lines there with more differences between them because at different frequencies, the rejection changes. It's very hard to control bass frequencies regardless of the direction they come from because they're not very directional.
Across the top of the slide here, you see an ElectroVoice RE635A omnidirectional microphone, which is a workhorse of the recording uh, business for audio for video. If you're going to use an omnidirectional microphone in the field, this one is pretty hard to hurt. Uh, it's a dynamic microphone, which we'll talk about in a moment. And uh, it's been around forever, but it just works and works. Next to that, you see a lavalier microphone that we might clip onto the Talent's uh, lapel or, uh, or shirt collar or something. Um, this one's a fairly large one that would have to only be used if it was acceptable to see the microphone. There are much smaller ones we can use if we have to hide them, but they're uh, a fair amount more expensive. Next to that, you see a very long microphone in a shock mount. That's a shotgun microphone. And next to that is a crown pressure zone or PZM microphone. This is called a boundary microphone also. And what happens is the sound hits the metal plate on the bottom and then reflects up into the microphone capsule, which is in that little black metal arm in the middle facing down at the plate. These are good for capturing um, broad signals such as a chorus. If you hang this uh, on a big piece of plexiglass and face it at the chorus, you'll get even more of that reflected effect. Or uh, I've taped these inside a piano lid facing down at the strings to do uh, a piano recording. You just have to make sure you fasten it extraordinarily well because you wouldn't want it to fall during the recording. A boundary microphone um, is also useful sometimes on a, uh, on a tabletop in front of a group of people speaking at a table because it'll pick up fairly uniformly for several people to the left and right as well as in front of it. Next to that, you see a Sure Dynamic Cardioid. That is a uh, Beta 58, which is a descendant of the SM58, a uh, handheld cardioid microphone that's been used for years and years uh, in the music business for a handheld microphone for bands and things, as well as other settings. It has a windscreen um, on the outside you see there that's to protect the microphone in this metal, and then there's a foam screen inside that to further protect the microphone from wind noise as well as uh, from P-pops, you know, plosive sounds. I mentioned proximity effect. Proximity effect refers to an emphasis on lower frequencies that varies with distance to the microphone. Dynamic microphones are more robust, generally speaking, and do not require phantom power. Phantom power energizes the coils in a microphone to enhance sensitivity and dynamic range. Condenser microphones require phantom power and generally have better sonic characteristics than dynamic microphones. A slight edge in sound quality does no good if it doesn't work, so dynamic microphones tend to be preferred for rougher field work, while on-camera microphones and in-studio microphones can be either type. Voice-only audio, such as dialogue in many of our videos, doesn't really require the extra ability of a condenser microphone in most cases. Here are some characteristic things to think about in microphone selection. Do you need to pick up the speaker while rejecting the audience noise? You probably want to put a cardioid or hypercardioid microphone on the podium. Can you predict, though, that the speaker will move around a lot on you and not maintain a uniform distance from the microphone? An omnidirectional microphone will minimize the proximity effect variations and make it easier to ride the levels live or in post without worrying about the other effects of their movement. Because even with an omnidirectional microphone, when someone moves off axis, it will get quieter, but it won't change its frequency response very much. And that makes it a little bit easier to follow the speaker when you're doing your edits in post and just turn the volume up a little bit if they stay off axis for any length of time and have it sound about right. You might notice, though, that those first two pieces of advice are in direct conflict with each other. So you have to make a decision what's more important, rejecting the audience noise or having a more uniform sound and volume as the speaker moves around a lot. Are you trying to record a classical orchestra? Well, the sensitivity and frequency response of a quality condenser microphone or pair of microphones or more will do a better job on the dynamic range and timbre of the instruments. Before you grab those condensers, though, will proper phantom power be available in the production? For handheld, outdoor, or other noisy situations, pick a microphone with appropriate handling characteristics or with an appropriate shock mount and wind filter. A lot of audio for broadcast video is, in essence, mono broadcast as stereo because it is single source, single microphone. We send it out on the left and right channels because most of our listeners are listening in stereo. When recording music or a group of people, we have the ability to actually place sources in the stereo field, and there are several ways to do so. 
One is to close mic each source and then mix them live or in post by panning the microphones to different places in the stereo field that represent where we believe each source should sound like it's coming from. If you can only use a pair of microphones, though, you need to know one or more of the AB, XY, and MS techniques. AB, or time difference stereo, depends on the sound from any one source arriving at the two microphones at slightly different times. How far apart the mics are spaced depends on the distance from the sources and the frequency of the lowest important tone. Typically, we want spacing to be one-fourth of the wavelength of the lowest important tone. Now, 40 to 60 centimeters is a good rule of thumb for more distance setups. For closer setups, 20 centimeters or so may be more advisable so that loud sources don't sound unnaturally far spread in the stereo field. I use a stereo mic bracket that provides uniform spacing for me whenever I do stereo recording. It's so I have one bracket on one stand with two microphones attached. XY, or coincidence stereo, depends on the signal arriving at the mics at the same time, but arriving at varying angles to the mic axes, depending on where the source is in the stereo field. The stereo effect comes from the difference in level that results from being more or less on axis. You can see in the diagram at the top of the slide, we, we will usually place these microphones capsules one directly over the other uh, at an angle to each other like this in order to get this effect. Now, MS, or mid-side, mixes a cardioid microphone with a figure eight microphone. Figure eight microphone actually has two different microphone capsules in it um, facing away from each other. And when you set a microphone like this to the figure eight pattern, it places those opposite each other and puts them out of phase with each other. And so when we use that phase difference to create the stereo field, but this requires not only this dual diaphragm uh, condenser microphone with a figure eight pattern setting specifically in it, but it also needs to be decoded to create a sum and difference matrix to create the stereo channels. So you're not as likely to use this in a community access cable television production. There are some disadvantages uh, because of the cost and complexity of the equipment and the decoding process, but there are also advantages to this technique. This is why I'm mentioning it. It's easier to make a mono-compatible version of the audio because you have that one microphone pointed straight ahead that can be the dominant sound in the mono channel. And you can also use the breadth of the stereo field. Uh, you can choose the breadth of the stereo field in post-production more easily because you have the sum and difference matrix that are created when you decode it. You can actually adjust how they work with each other and make the stereo field sound uh, narrower or wider. Let's listen to a few of these stereo configurations, as well as some proximity effect differences with different types of microphones and distances. So this is a stereo recording of me talking in front of a pair of uh, nearly identical microphones. Same brand, same model, frequency response charts are pretty closely matched, but they were not bought as a matched pair. And I'm probably about six inches away from the microphones, which are probably about six to eight inches apart from each other, which creates some interesting dilemmas when it comes to stereo uh, recording and then to mono mix down of stereo recording. Now we're going to record another passage of me talking in front of the stereo pair of microphones. Again, fairly close to the microphones, a little further this time, maybe a foot to a foot and a half away. Uh, but as I'm recording this time, I'm in an XY configuration. Now normally you would not try XY miking this close, nor would you probably do it for a single person just talking like this. Uh, however, we're going to do it just for example purposes so we can see how that one sounds in a stereo field. For this next sound, I've spread the microphones wider and I'm actually hitting them both off axis, but from two different sides. So I'll be very curious to see how this sounds both in stereo and in a mono mix down. So I'm now using an Electra Voice 635A microphone, which is an omnidirectional microphone. And I want you to notice that as I hold it very close to my mouth, my lips are basically touching the windscreen, or if I hold it farther away from my mouth and talk a little louder, Either way, the bass response should be about the same with this type of microphone. Now, I'm gonna pause and switch microphones. So now I'm using a Shure SM58 cardioid microphone and I'm holding it again very close to my mouth. My lips are basically touching the windscreen and you should hear a pronounced emphasis on the bass at this distance. Now, I'll move it away 
And as I move it away and talk louder, first of all, it's obviously quieter because of the distance, but you should notice a lot less bass emphasis because the proximity effect is less at this distance. So I'm using the ElectroVoice 635A and I'm holding it a little further from my mouth at this point because I'm trying to emulate a microphone on a podium that a presenter might be using. And the reason for that is because although I'm facing center right now and looking at the middle of my imaginary audience, I'm going to also turn my head to my left, checking the presenter's left side of the audience as I sweep the corners of the room, and then I'm going to sweep back across and talk to the people on my right as well to make sure that I'm making eye contact with all of the audience and being a good presenter. Then I'll come back to center. The differences should have been minor and mostly only uh, in volume as I did that with the omnidirectional microphone. I'm going to switch to a cardioid microphone and repeat that in just a moment. So let's try the same exercise with a cardioid microphone. I've switched back to the Shure SM58, common cardioid microphone, especially for uh, singers. And I'm going to use that to do the same type of sweeping of the room. So I'm talking to the center of the crowd right now. And then I'm going to turn to my left and speak to the people on that side of the room. And then I'll sweep back across the room all the way over to my right and speak to the people on that side of the room. So the difference should have been a little more noticeable with this type of microphone as I come back to center now. Um, but again, it would primarily be in volume because I'm using a single microphone that's panned to the center of the stereo field. So the phase differences won't be as apparent as they might have been with stereo miking that was then mixed down to one channel. But the volume differences are there and it points out one of the challenges we have to deal with when recording presenters. So let's try something kind of interesting here. I've put the 635A much further away from myself. It's probably at least three feet away from me right now. Uh, and of course, that's going to make for a quieter signal. I might need more gain and I might pick up a little more noise. But as the presenter who's looking towards the center of my audience and then sweeping to my left and speaking to the people on my left, sweeping back to the right and speaking to the people on my right and then returning to center, I wonder if the volume differences will be as great with the microphone distance further away. So I'd like to repeat that one more time, this time with the SM58, which is more of a cardioid pattern. Obviously, I'm not going to get as much bass because of the proximity effect with the microphone this far away. But as I speak to the microphone facing center audience and then sweep to my left and speak to the left side of the audience, then sweep back around to my right and speak to the right side of the audience and then return to center. Let's see how the volume differences sound. As you're planning your production, there are many considerations that affect microphone choice. We've mentioned some of these already. Will you be constrained to the in-camera microphone because of other production considerations? If you can use an external mic, will it be on-camera? on talent, on a fixed stand, handheld, or boom operated, or something else. Do you need a stereo, mono, or both final product? If both, what do you have to do in the stereo recording to make sure it is also mono compatible? Sometimes when you do a stereo recording, the way the microphones are spaced and interact with each other, when you put them together in a mono mix down, ends up with too much phase cancellation and it makes your sound, if not go away, at least sound weird and uh, diminished or hollowed out, uh, which is not a desirable effect in most cases. What are the characteristics of the source? If you have talent with a tendency for plosives where they pop their P's or sibilants where the S's are overly accentuated, can you make microphone decisions that'll help minimize those? Will you be able to close mic the source or do you have to be far away? Is ambiance desirable or something to minimize? And how likely are you to need to overdub later? What's the environment? Is there a hum from an indoor fluorescent light or a stage lighting board? Do airplanes fly by or church bells ring nearby? Is there potential interference with your wireless microphones from nearby cell, tone, cell phone towers or uh, other radio sources and, and so forth? Do you have impossibly long cable runs that make it really hard to use wired microphones? 
will phantom power sufficient for the desired microphone be readily available? Or do you really have to use dynamic microphones regardless of what you're capturing because you don't have a, a power capability for condenser microphones? Will the mic serve more than one purpose, such as recording and live sound reinforcement? Well, oftentimes when that happens, you have a, a presenter at a podium with a microphone on a stand and it would look perfectly natural for there to be more than one microphone there. If you do that, then you can have one that's optimized for the live sound reinforcement and one that's optimized for recording. What do you know about the talent? Do they work a mic well or do they move towards and away from it or even stand away from it as if it is something to fear? If the mic is for recording only, do they know that? Because if they don't, they're going to think something is wrong when they don't hear themselves, and that's not going to come across well to the live audience or on the recording. So here's several scenarios for microphone placement. A lavalier being clipped to the talent's shirt, an overhead microphone for a chorus, a boom microphone off camera, a podium situation, and a sports event from the sideline. We haven't talked about parabolic mics yet, but that might be the solution to the football scenario. How would you mic the construction shot? The podium? What stereo techniques could we use for the chorus if we had a couple small condensers to hang? Well, as we think those through, for that construction shot, I'm going to be concerned about traffic noise, construction noise, the rustling of the paper, a variety of things I can't control well. And that noise, which you could consider room tone, even though they're outdoors, might be important to me in post-production because I might want some of that natural environment. But I might also want to be able to control the volume of the, the gentlemen that are talking to each other versus the volume of all that other noise. Now, when I look at this shot, and I'm just guessing because it's just a photograph that I found, it seems to me that it's very well lit for a construction site. If you look at the light being caught in their helmets, for example, it looks to me like that's being lit specifically for the photograph or video production. If that's the case, and these are actors or at least uh, professionals who can easily repeat their lines, I'd actually be tempted to uh, record this in the field with microphones that are uh, close to the speakers, probably just some lavaliers clipped on their collars, but also then take them back to the studio to do what's called automated dialogue replacement, where they reread the lines in a controlled environment while they're listening to themselves on tape. This allows you to get the lip sync right, um, and then you have complete control of the volume level of the ambient noise versus the volume level of the talent. And I'd also record that noise in the construction environment while they were not talking uh, so that I have that an ambient noise I can use underneath their studio voices without worrying about whether their studio voices and on-site voices happen at exactly the same time or not or sound right when mixed together, etc. For the chorus, I'd be tempted to hang a pair of those microphones in the air above them, just out of camera range, about a 45 degree angle pointing right down at them um, in one of the stereo patterns that we talked about, if I only had a couple of uh, condensers that I could use. At the podium, I need to understand if the person speaking is going to be the only presenter or not, first and foremost. If I only have one wireless microphone, it's not a lot of fun to have one person taking it off and having the next one try to put it on as they change positions at the podium. I'd be more tempted to put a microphone on a stand if that was the case. Now here's a shot with two people at a table in front of a green screen. There's studio lighting present. So how can we best mic this shot? And what are we thinking about as we make that choice? Well, as I look at this, I've got one camera. I've got two people that appear to be relatively stationary, although they are standing, so they could move a little bit. I've got lighting that could make some electrical noise, so I'm going to be a little bit worried about wireless and even wired microphones, depending on how I run the cables. Uh, and so in this environment, I'm going to be tempted to place microphones, uh, probably short shotgun microphones, just off camera above them, probably on boom microphone stands, not boom mics that somebody has to hold the boom for, because uh, I don't expect that they're going to need to move to follow the talent or anything. And I might, if I can't do that, I might be tempted just to put a shotgun microphone on the camera since I've got a little bit of distance there. Uh, not the long one we saw earlier, but a medium-length shotgun microphone and see how that records. 
Or I could put a boundary microphone like the Crown PZM right on the table in front of them. Could be another option. So there's a number of ways I could go. Probably my best bet here is to put a medium shotgun on the camera and use one of those other techniques closer to the talent so I have a backup plan. Now this shot is a little bit more complicated. I've got six people and some sort of a panel set up. How would I mic them? And if I don't have a mixer or a multi-channel recorder that could handle six separate microphones, how would you change your answer? Well, there's not one right answer. I'd like you to think through the pros and cons of a few setups uh, and then maybe discuss those with each other. As I look at this, my first question is how long does each person talk? Is this a you know, is there a moderator that's going to ask a question and then they're each going to take a turn answering it? Or is this a situation where one's going to step forward and talk for a long time and then the next one and so on? Or uh, some other situation? If they're each going to talk only for a short amount of time and then turn to the next person, I'd actually be tempted to do this with a handheld microphone that they simply pass from one to another as they're speaking. I'd coach them in advance so they know where and how to hold the microphone. I'd use a microphone with low handling noise. And I'd keep a, uh, a, again, probably a medium shotgun microphone on camera as my backup plan and for synchronization purposes. Because as they go through the row, I'm probably going to turn the camera towards the person talking, and that shotgun might serve me well when I do that. Now, not all sources come in through microphones from the live shot. A lot of our sources do come from microphones, but sometimes they come to us on a memory card or in a file someone uh, makes available to us for download or by email or many other ways that we might get uh, digital media. Now, we talked about uh, getting a feed from the mixer earlier, and I want to reemphasize that last idea I mentioned there, which was asking the audio engineer if she has a separate mix set up for uh, capturing the audio for online publication or for making a CD. If, the, if she or he does, it'd be great if you could get a feed of that mix because that mix is going to stay adjusted properly throughout. It's not going to get turned up and down based on what's happening in the room. It's not going to have strange EQ to make up for the characteristics of the room and how they affect the sound. So it might make for a better recording for your video uh, audio. Now, other sources could originate with mics but come to us from a portable recorder or, as I was mentioning, on the media from uh, other video like multiple cameras, so a memory card, for example. We might be overdubbing in a voice after the fact to fix a problem or we might or add dialogue on top of what was a noisy scene to shoot. Maybe we want to set the scene on a quiet studio set with suitable ambiance for the scene, and we're going to use uh, generic loops to build up that ambiance. I might make a construction scene out of um, some city traffic noise, uh, some construction equipment noise, and maybe um, a welder sparking periodically in the background as an example. And then I'll put that underneath my recorded narration that was shot in a quiet studio. Uh, we talked about room tone earlier, and so we may also feed in a bed of music from an audio clip, or we might need Foley or special effects. There are a lot of places that sound can come from that we have to add into our mix. When we do this, there's a number of things we have to think about. Uh, are the volume levels appropriate from source to source and, and type of sound to type of sound? Uh, is the room tone Correct. If I do automated dialogue replacement or voiceover in post, I wouldn't want to have a short section of my scene uh, be replaced from that uh, post-production work and have no ambiance or room tone underneath it while the rest of the same dialogue does. That would sound really odd. I also want to make sure that the environment sounds right. So EQ and reverb uh, need to be considered to make sure that the the uh, replacement post-production sounds fit the scene. And of course, if I'm doing automated dialogue replacement, lip movement is going to have to fit as well. So I have to be really careful with my synchronization. Now, a common scenario is having multiple sources of the same signal. You might use two microphones at slightly different levels. So you get a good strong signal, but you also have a fallback in case that strong signal gets too strong and distorts. You can cut that uh, lower level microphone in temporarily if the person gets a lot louder than you expected them to, for example. You might use, in that case, the on-camera microphone to capture the audio just for the purpose of syncing up with a better external audio recording. 
I sometimes put the portable audio recorder with its built-in microphones or a better microphone um, near the talent and a microphone on the camera further away. Uh, and I will use whichever one comes out best, and I'll use the other one to synchronize the audio to the video. Final Cut Pro 10 has a built-in ability for multi-cam productions uh, when I'm using the audio for more than one camera. And it also has the ability to just sync audio to video based on sound. So I really like to have that capability and that's why I want sound in the camera regardless of whether I plan to use the sound from the camera. When you do this, you want to make sure you name your sources properly when creating your multi-cam clips. Uh, and the way you're going to do that is in the field in the general description. Uh, in your inspector box for the video, you go to the info tab and you make sure you choose the general or one of the other very detailed lists of fields and you find the camera angle um, and camera name. And the angle is what you want to uh, make sure you label correctly. Uh, you'd use typically things like wide or close or right or left or right close, uh, etc., to characterize the camera angle. And that makes it really easy when you're using the angle view in Final Cut to choose which camera you want at any given point in time. Now, if you want to keep the one best audio source the whole time that you're switching cameras, you're gonna to wanna to change the angle editor in Final Cut so that when you uh, press a button or click on a angle to switch, to literally cut your video um, from camera to camera, it does not cut the audio with the video. And you'll see there's three little icons in the upper left of the angle editor that accomplish this. Uh, one is video only, one is audio only, and one is both. So you're typically going to choose video only in the scenario I just described. I'm going to talk somewhat generically about camera settings. Each brand and model tends to be slightly different. These are fairly common settings though. They may be called something different from camera to camera. You may or may not need to know a lot about these or to set them manually, but you should know what they should be set to so you can make sure the last person that used the camera didn't leave it such that your audio is doomed. Now, most cameras have automatic settings and you, they can be useful for fast run and gun productions where you don't have time to be watching the manual levels and trying to adjust them or you only have one camera and if you try to make an adjustment to a manual level while you're uh, recording, you're probably going to shake the camera. Uh, on the plus side, you tend to have fewer distortion problems also with automatic settings. If you set the camera to manual or to an audio scene that allows manual adjustments, you can decide whether to adjust other settings to fit the situation and maybe keep the automatic levels. If you do want to manually control levels, the microphone level is the most important setting. You're going to need to do a mic check pre-production and emphasize the need for the talent to speak at production level volume. So you can set a level that balances headroom with a good strong signal. In the camera, you may also find a setting for an automatic windscreen, which is really just a set of digital filters that try to filter out the noise from the wind. I'd rather try to do that in post if I have to try to solve that problem. If you're going to uh, use a windscreen when you're capturing the sound, my recommendation is to use a real one. The foam cover that comes with many microphones, the uh, the more comprehensive uh, so-called dead cat, those big furry covers for microphones that you see sometimes, or the metal and foam encapsulation type thing. It looks like a big tablet that you would swallow for medicine, but it's called a Zeppelin, um, and it encloses the microphone. If the signal is especially strong, a lot of cameras also have a setting for an attenuator. An attenuator lowers the gain before the level control in the camera comes into play to give you more headroom. There's sometimes also a bass roll-off option to reduce low frequencies if you have rumble issues. Some cameras have more than one audio input and have settings for the audio mix. This is important if you're using multiple external microphones or the internal microphone plus an external microphone. You need to think about do you want to record those as dual mono and mix them later or do you want to pre-mix them into a stereo mix to reduce your post-production work. Are they actually representing a left and a right channel or are they representing something different like the presenter in one microphone and the room or the audience in another microphone? These are going to be considerations for how you mix them together or not during your production and then what you have to do in post-production. 
You might use two microphones, as I mentioned earlier, with one at a higher level and one set to a lower level as a headroom precaution. Again, in that case, you're going to record typically dual mono, and you're only going to use the stronger microphone until and unless you run into a problem where it peaks above zero, and then you can temporarily switch to the other microphone to, uh, to solve that problem. The most important thing to think about with camera settings is that at the production is not the place to try to learn or remember how the mic mix settings work on your camera. It's better to have practiced those and, and memorized those in advance or at least become very familiar with them so you know where to look and what probably has to be changed when you encounter various kinds of problems. I also like to carry the manual for my camera as a PDF file on my laptop and even in my phone so that I can look things up if I don't remember where they are. Some cameras also have a, a feature called directionality or something like that. It uses some phase magic to uh, reject more off-axis sound and try to make the microphone behave more like a shotgun microphone. If you need that kind of reach, I prefer to go for an external solution and actually use a shotgun microphone, but sometimes it's the only tool you have. Some camcorders also have frequency response or EQ settings. They might have scenes for things like speech versus music versus something else, or they might just have EQ settings you can manipulate, uh, simple ones like bass, mid, and treble, or uh, in some cases, a representation of a multiband equalizer. I don't recommend using those a lot in the field. Um, if you have an obvious problem that needs solving, if there's a bunch of hiss and you want to just roll off the high end, or if there's some heavy duty rumble and you want to roll off the low end, uh, then go ahead and do that. But if you're trying to make the sound better by trying to enhance it, I would wait and do that in post-production where you can actually hear what you're trying to do. Now there's two things that are really important to know how to do on your camera. One is know where the meters are and how to turn those on and read them so you can check the levels in your sound check and during recording. Uh, on some of the camcorders, the meters are not there by default and you have to go turn them on. Also, know where the headphone output is and, if it's a multi-purpose connector, how to activate it. When you plug in your headphones and nothing is coming through them, even though you can see their meters moving, it can be very disconcerting if you don't know what's going on. And sometimes it's simply because you have a multi-purpose connector and it's set to output audio instead of uh, in a digital form or something instead of in a signal for a headphone. Or sometimes it's set to be an input instead of an output and you're not going to get anything out of it that way. So make sure you know how to set that up because as we mentioned earlier, listening is really important to getting good audio. Balanced cables, as I mentioned earlier, are more immune to noise and they attenuate the signal less in longer cable runs. Microphones should always be connected with balanced cables except for very short connections. And those balanced cables, again, are the ones that typically have the three-pin three XLR connectors, as you see in the upper left of this slide. Adapters create risk. They can be a source of noise, they can interrupt ground, they can come apart when you least expect it, and they should be avoided as much as possible. Use the right cables. If you find yourself using an adapter over and over again, consider acquiring a cable with the needed connectors on each end. If you're using an adapter to connect a high impedance source to a low impedance input, such as connecting an electric guitar to a recording device, a direct box should be used. A direct box or direct interface, or just DI for short, is an impedance matching device that does more than just match the connectors. See the image on the upper right of the slide for a very common direct box from Countryman. Note that it expects an amplifier or instrument input and outputs it as if it is a microphone. Ground can be lifted if there's a ground buzz. Sometimes when we have a buzz in our cables, by lifting the ground, we can isolate a ground difference between where the recording device is plugged into AC power and where um, a piece of equipment on the stage is plugged in, for example, if that's what we're using the direct box for. Cables can play tricks on you. My cables should be tested with a polarity tester or a simple meter to make sure they are all wired the same. Some have the signal, signal pins reversed, and this can give you phase headaches that are very hard to diagnose. Cables should be routed for the safety of themselves and people. Use cable protectors or bridges if possible instead of tape, as every time you take up taped cables, you stress the cables more and leave residue on the cables that makes them hold dirt. Cable bridges are also faster to set up and tear down in many cases. 
In the long run, cable protectors save money with gaffer's tape running as much as $20 a roll. For carpeted spaces, there are now some protectors that Velcro themselves to the carpet so you don't need to use any tape at all. Here's a trick question. What's the biggest source of problems with wireless microphones? Well, there's a couple of possible answers here, including clothing noise, uh, including radio interference. But the one I'm looking for here is wires, ironically enough. Uh, treat the cables and connectors for wireless microphones with extra care. They're smaller and more fragile, and they should be tested regularly. I'm especially referring to the wire that goes from the microphone to the transmitter pack that's typically worn on a belt or slipped into a pocket on the talent. Speaking of cost, microphone cables are $20 and more as well. Replacing and repairing them is expensive and time-consuming. More importantly, having unsavable, bad sound for your production because of a bad cable is not the result we're after. So take care of your cables. Don't stress them by wrapping them around your hand and elbow like a piece of rope. Gently wind them with a turn on each loop so they lay flat and use a Velcro strap to keep them neat. Walk to the connector when winding. Don't drag it across the floor. Cables should be tested before use, especially if you're headed into the field and won't have a lot of spares lying around. If you find a bad cable, don't toss it back into the pile. Set it aside, attach a note, and bring it to the attention of whoever repairs or replaces cable. It's a good practice to have a cable inventory and testing day every so often. With one person sorting, one person testing, and one person repairing, it goes quickly and everyone's productions benefit. Testing audio gear and cables involves listening first and foremost. Run a signal through the cable and listen. Move the cable a bit to test for loose connections. Don't stop with your ears though. A simple multimeter or a purpose-made cable tester like this one from Swiss Army can speed up the process and identify what is wrong, not just whether something is wrong, which makes repairs go faster. Record something through the entire signal chain as well. When you play it back, you can amplify it to listen and look for issues you might not otherwise have heard. The first rule of finding and fixing audio problems is to anticipate and prevent audio problems. It is almost always easier to prevent than to fix an audio problem. Hum can often be fixed with Final Cut Pro's automatic audio tools. We're going to listen to a voice over an electrical hum. It's a, a 60 hertz hum, as you might hear here in the United States from common uh, AC electrical sources. So let's listen. So if I'm talking while that hum is in the background, I'm, I'm... Okay, now let's take a look at the audio enhancements or those automated tools in Final Cut Pro and see what they can do with the sound. First, we need to get our audio inspector open. So since this is an audio clip, I'm going to select it down here then I know that uh, if I open my inspector, either going Window, Show Inspector, or pressing Command 4, that I'm going to have the audio window open. If I had chose a video clip with audio embedded in it, the inspector might have opened on the video panel, and I would have just clicked Audio here at the top to get to the audio panel. At any rate, these are the audio enhancements, and you can see right now our EQ is flat, that the audio analysis thinks that there are problems with the clip, uh, and nothing has been adjusted yet. So if I click on the right arrow, it'll take me to those audio enhancements. These are the, the somewhat automated tools for eliminating various problems in our audio. The first one is loudness, and that can be a useful tool if you have a, too wide of a dynamic range and you want to bring the quieter passages up closer to the louder passages to get greater overall loudness. I generally do that by using the volume controls in something like a compressor or a limiter, uh, but sometimes the loudness tool gets it done quickly and easily and saves you time. The next one is a background noise removal tool, and it's detected that there's some consistent noise through this clip that it might be able to help with. It's probably harmonics from the hum. So I'm going to leave that alone for now and look at the hum first. And you can see the hum removal tool has this red explanation point on it, indicating that it thinks there's a problem. It's set to 60 hertz already, uh, which is the default, and again, that's here in the United States. And so if I simply turn that on, it will attempt to remove the hum. And let's go ahead and listen to the clip again and see uh, if we've made a big improvement without hurting the sound of the voice too much. Here we go. If I'm talking while that hum is in the background, um, I wonder if we'll be... Great. And then one more thing I'd like to do is listen to the, that same clip 
with the background noise removal turned on and see if that adds additional value. And I'm going to leave it at 45%. Let's listen to that. I wonder if we'll be able to fix the hum without affecting the... So those were Final Cut Pro 10's audio enhancements. The hum removal was pretty effective. The background noise removal was also effective, but it had a more audible impact on the voice. We might have tried an alternative of just using EQ to kill those higher frequencies. AC electric hum in the United States will typically be at 60 Hz, with possible harmonics at multiples thereof. If your source has important content at 60 Hz, you're going to significantly impact the sound quality if you filter out the hum. Again, it's better to try to avoid it than to try to fix it. Hiss can often be reduced with a low-pass filter that rolls off the higher frequencies where the hiss occurs. You'll lose air from your sound, but you may improve it enough for it to be worthwhile. EQ can be used to warm, sweeten, add air, improve apparent loudness, make room for multiple sources such as when mixing a band, and to create effects. Denoise is a tool for identifying the noise, you do have a room tone print, don't you, and trying to reduce or eliminate it. If the noise isn't highly overlapped with the source frequencies, this can be a fast, powerful way to improve audio. Sometimes you can mix a denoised clip with the original clip at a lower level to restore some lost frequencies while gaining overall in loudness and clarity. If you look at how to denoise in Final Cut Pro 10, you should locate a section of the audio where only noise is audible. That's typically your room tone print, uh, but it could just be a quiet passage between two phrases that the speaker is speaking. You're going to loop that so you can hear it over and over again and set the threshold value of the denoiser so that only signals at or below that level are filtered out. Then you're going to play the audio signal with your, so your source in it and set the reduce value to the point where the noise reduction is optimal but little of the appropriate signal is reduced. If you encounter artifacts, you can use the smoothing parameter to try to smooth those out. If you have phase cancellation, you can reverse polarity on one of the signals to try to correct it. This can be done in software, not only during capture, as long as the channels are recorded separately. Where is polarity in Final Cut Pro? Well, you want to look in your effects for something called a direction mixer and use that to invert phase by changing it by 180 degrees or whatever appropriate mount makes the sound sound right. Also notice in the direction mixer that there's a mid-side decoder capability there if you do choose to try mid-side stereo recording. There are purists who would never touch the automatic settings. I'm not one of them. If the automatic tools can fix my problem and move my project forward faster, I have more time for more projects. If they introduce unacceptable artifacts or just can't solve the problem, I'm just as quick to disable them and turn to the manual tools. These tools are great when they work, but there are limits. Final Cut Pro 10 also includes many manual tools for more precise audio work. Final Cut Pro 10 works with 44.1 or 48 kHz audio in WAVE or AIFF audio interchange file format. Final Cut Pro clips can be mono, stereo, or surround, but Final Cut Pro always outputs stereo or surround. In Final Cut Pro, you work on the audio for a clip at a time, but there are ways to copy settings from one clip to another or to use presets to make it easy to replicate something that works. Although it's not normally the, the logical workflow sequence, sometimes it's best in Final Cut Pro to try to make some of your major changes on your clips before you start cutting them up. Because if you apply, for example, equalization or compression or reverb to the entire clip after you import it, when you start cutting it up, those settings and effects will remain with each of the clips that result from the cuts. Whereas if you cut it first and then you apply those things to the first one, for example, you then have to copy them or re-establish them on the subsequent clips if you want them all to sound the same. Remember that mixing audio is an additive process. We worked hard to make sure we didn't exceed zero decibels in our capture and individual clips. We also need to make sure the sum of clips played together doesn't exceed zero dB in the final edit. You can change the portion of audio that shows in the timeline for combined audio and video clips to make it easier to see audio issues 
and you can turn on the large meters to see the total audio level more easily. Remember that yellow peaks in the waveform indicate loud passages and red indicates crossing zero. In the upper left, you see the actual waveform in bright green and a ghosted waveform behind it in a duller green. The dull waveform is for reference. These make it easier to see the waveform shape when volume levels are set low, which makes the actual waveform very small. If you're trying to time a cut to an audio event, these can be very helpful. When you click the small meters, you turn, it'll turn on the large meters in the lower right. Final Cut Pro meters read peak audio, not RMS. Peak meters are safer for avoiding distortion, but the human ear hears more like RMS meters. In the digital world, I prefer the safety of peak meters. There are several ways to adjust clip volume with the mouse or the keyboard. It is also helpful to use the range tool if you're trying to adjust a specific section of a clip, such as for ducking. Ducking is when I would, for example, lower the volume of a music bed during a part where I'm narrating. So I want to select that range of the music bed by hitting the R key or selecting the range tool uh, with the mouse and then dragging the mouse over that section of the music bed for, while I'm holding it down. Don't do that when the mouse is right over the volume line in the clip though because it'll try to adjust the volume instead of doing a range selection. When you get the range selected, you can then adjust its volume up and down and Final Cut will automatically insert a pair of keyframes on the beginning and end of that section so the volume for just that section can be lowered or raised. Now to raise or lower the volume, we can just grab that line through the audio clip with our mouse and drag it up or down. Uh, we can also select the clip and use the control equals uh, to raise the volume or the control minus to lower the volume on the keyboard. We can also go to the modify menu and choose adjust volume and make either an absolute or a relative change. Uh, there's keyboard uh, shortcuts for these as well. Control option L allows you to make an absolute level change. So change the volume from what it is now to 6 dB regardless of what it was. I want to go to minus 6 or a relative change which says I don't care what it is now but I want it to be about half as loud so I'm going to cut it by three decibels. And so you would in that case use your control L and say make a minus 3 dB relative change. You can also go into the audio inspector and use the slider there to change the volume. And when you're dragging the volume line up and down on the clip, holding the command key down while you do that will give you a more precise adjustments. Now, sometimes when we're making an edit in a video sequence, it's better to make an edit where the sound precedes or trails the video cut. To make these so-called J or L cuts in Final Cut Pro 10, we expand the audio from the video clip so we can separate the cut points. Think of a dialogue scene where you ping pong the first few times uh, two people take their turns talking but then want to cut the audio while staying focused on the listener to show his or her facial emotions while the other person talks. So you're going to cut from camera and audio to camera and audio and so forth, but then you're going to cut audio without cutting camera to stay on the listener. Audio can be hard cut, cross faded, it can fade out and then fade back in, or it can be overlapped and it doesn't have to cut at the same time as video. There are times when you'll want to cut audio ahead of or behind the video cut for specific reasons, such as the J or L cut we talked about a moment ago, or other reasons. In general, audio changes should not be abrupt unless you know why you're making them so. So in Final Cut Pro, there's a basic EQ on every audio clips inspector panel. And if you click the little EQ looking icon next to that, you'll get the custom controls where you can see the sliders to, to change the different frequency bands on the equalizer. There's also a button to change between a 10 band and a 31 band equalizer. Uh, basically an equalizer uh, that equalizes at octaves and one that equalizes at third octaves. When you switch between those, the curve resets. So be aware of that. If you get it sounding just right and then you decide you want finer grained control, you're going to lose your settings when you click to change to 31 band. There's also a button in there that you can use to just flatten the curve back out if you don't like what you've done and you want to quickly start over again. Now, I can't think of a great use for it, but if you want to draw your equalization curve, you can hold down the control key and use the mouse uh, to draw the curve. 
by clicking and dragging it across the screen and so forth. I don't particularly like that technique. I think you need to use your ears more and adjust them individually. There are some presets that can be good starting points, but the presets in this basic equalizer um, aren't that useful in my, in my experience. Some of the other equalizers you can bring in from the effects uh, panel are, have better presets to learn from. Now, if you get a set of EQ settings that is really working well and you like them and they're something you think are going to be useful on another clip from the same sequence or the next time you work in that same room, you might want to save your settings as a preset and give it an intuitive name. It's useful to make sure you know where you are in the timeline. Sometimes when you're uh, using the settings for audio and making adjustments, you think you're listening to or making changes to a particular clip, but you really still have a different clip selected somewhere else in the timeline, and that's the one that's being acted on. Uh, so be careful when you do that. To make it easier, you can make sure that you play back just the selection you want or even to loop it. When you use the slash key instead of the space bar to start playback, it's going to play back just what's selected. And you can use Command L to toggle playback looping um, so that it plays over and over again while you experiment with adjustments, especially useful on short clips. You can use roles in Final Cut to organize and manage your like clips, such as all dialogue, all the music beds, or all the special effects. You won't find a lot of use for these unless you do a lot of your audio editing outside of Final Cut. If you're going to export what's known as stems to do your audio work somewhere else or to send all the voiceover clips to a voiceover artist to practice or re-record, then you would uh, want to have those organized into roles to make it easy to separate them during export. So let's look at some more of the tools in Final Cut Pro. Uh, you can use the search box in the effects panel to find a specific effect. So let's go find the denoiser by typing denoise into the, the search box, and that'll make it, that way we don't have to know what category it's in. We can just find it quickly. Um, I also want to show you where to find a uh, spectrum analyzer so you can look at where the frequencies uh, of your sound lie on the, on the spectrum, not just try to hear them. Uh, and I don't recommend doing your audio editing by eye alone. You should always be listening as well. But sometimes it's faster to narrow in on where you need an adjustment by seeing it or seeing and hearing it instead of just trying to listen for it, especially if you haven't trained your ears that well yet. So let's go find that. There's actually two places that are easy to get to that. One is in the linear EQ and one is in the channel EQ. Those EQs, I believe, are both included with Final Cut Pro now, even though they come from Logic. Uh, Apple sound software. Also, you can find a correlation meter, uh, which can be useful for looking for phase problems. If your audio is perfectly in phase, the needle will stay in the center, uh, but if your audio is out of phase, it'll start to move into the red or the blue zones to show you your problem so you can understand whether you need to make a correction. Now there's a specific tool that can be very handy for managing spoken word audio clip levels. This is Final Cut Pro 10's limiter. So I'm going to walk through how to find and apply the limiter and what settings to use for a good starting point. So for my starting settings, I'm going to set my output level to minus four and a half decibels, maybe just minus three decibels if I'm not going to add a lot of other sound to this production that are going to add together in my final mix. I'm going to set a long release of 300 milliseconds, but I'm going to leave my look ahead and my soft knee settings at the defaults, 2 milliseconds of look ahead and a soft knee. And the gain, I can't give you a, a recommended starting point for that because it's going to vary every time you use the filter depending on your source audio and what you're trying to fix. Now, remember that the limiter will raise noise along with everything else. So you want to be careful about how much gain to apply and how you use this. For more complex sources, a compressor can be useful, but I generally prefer to do compression in the front of the signal path when recording rather than in post. I might use a little compression for audio mastering, but I don't like to do a lot of compression on individual clips or tracks in post. Having said that, there is a role for compression in post. Compression can be used to make quiet seem quieter and loud seem louder in that peak levels can be held closer to quiet levels or all levels can be boosted by holding down the peak levels. There can be scenes in a video where one of these is a great fit. 
Think of that loud whisper for a golf announcer. Final Cut Pro also has a multi-presser, which allows similar effects as a compressor, but with different settings for different frequency ranges. So it has a couple of what's called crossover frequencies in it, and you can control the compression um, at the bottom and the top, as well as in the segments in between those crossover points. So there's four bands of frequencies that you can make adjustments in. So if the bass in a music segment is putting your total mix into peak territory too often, you can compress the low end instead of using EQ. You'll need to compare those two solutions and see which one sounds better for your purposes. Final Cut Pro 10 can be used to record voiceovers directly. I often record my voiceovers and narration in Logic Pro and then bring the clip into Final Cut, but the built-in tools are great for simple needs or for lining up replacement dialogue with the original source where I need lip sync to be perfect. Here's how to do it. You go, go to the Window menu and choose Record Voiceover, or you can press Option Command 8 on the keyboard as long as you don't have the zoom features turned on in the accessibility tools in the operating system, because they use the same hotkey, unfortunately. Once you've got this set up, you can record as many takes as are needed. You can combine those into an audition or just stack them up as parallel takes, depending on how you, you like to work. You can then uh, take bits and pieces of each of the takes if you need to using the range tool and just dropping the volume. Uh, you can combine them into one compound clip and then apply EQ and other effects to make that easier. And if you're trying to do dialogue replacement specifically and you need to have lip sync, you can unmute the project so you can listen while you're recording. Just make sure you use headphones if you do that because you don't want the sound from speakers feeding into the microphone and creating its own sort of reverb uh, in your ADR. Now we're going to listen to some audio issues we could encounter when recording our video in the field. Many of these are very difficult to remove in post, and so I want you to think about ways to prevent them or work around them. Also, when it comes to capturing room tone, think about how you might get room tone that doesn't include these kinds of sounds because they may recur if you loop that sound, and it would sound very strange, for example, to hear church bells ringing every 30 seconds. So on the subject of noise and tone printing a room, let's see what happens if you're listening to me speak and things change about the environment that I'm speaking from. Anything sound a little bit odd in this audio track? Now, if you did that as the soundtrack on a video and the background noise was even reinforced by visual cues in the video, and then you had to overdub some of the sound in the studio, but you didn't have a clean tone print to put behind that overdub, do you think that's going to work well? On the other hand, if I'm announcing the evening news and I have a loud music intro, 
Do you think I want to leave it at the same volume the entire time that I talk for the intro? Probably not. In these next examples, we recorded some room tone and then we used a combination of EQ settings to crush that room tone or lower it by about uh, 12 to 14 decibels. And then we applied that same EQ to a cello and to the spoken voice to see what side effects we could hear. You may want to listen to these the first time with your eyes closed and then listen again watching the subtitles to see if you heard the point where it, the sound changed. What if we record some spoken word and then we see the effect of our crush room tone EQ choices on a person's voice? Note that Final Cut Pro 10 has EQ presets for various vocals and musical situations. Knowing what frequencies make up the sound of voices in various instruments and what frequencies have which effects can be very valuable. What frequency would you boost to add power to a male voice? Or how about to add air to an acoustic guitar? With more dynamic sources, setting levels once and leaving them alone won't work. If you have a sound person that can ride the levels during capture, you'll have a better clip to work with, but they need to be able to hear the future in order to achieve perfection. In post, we can look and listen ahead before deciding what to do. We can then use manual changes, dynamic tools like the limiter or a compressor, or animation or keyframing to automate our level settings throughout a difficult section. Ideally, we'll do as much as we can in Capture to give us the best signal to work with, then perfect it in Post where we have this ability to automate adjustments by seeing and hearing the future. Ear training can be a course unto itself. If you want to improve your editing speed and the quality of your audio for video, get more familiar with hearing specific notes, chords, including identifying the root and the chord type, become adept at recognizing dissonance, resonance, harmony, and different scales. Here's a cookbook of starting recipes for various audio enhancements and improvements. Generally, we say enhancement when we're adding and improvement when we're cutting. We can see that to strengthen a male voice, we might try adding 2 decibels at 160 Hz with a Q of 1. Q refers to the narrowness of the EQ adjustment. A Q of 1 is a very wide bandwidth setting. A wider Q is more often used when boosting or enhancing, while Q, high Q or narrow bandwidth is more common when cutting or improving audio with EQ. You might imagine that if we want to generally strengthen something, we're going to, we're going to boost a range of frequencies, whereas if we're trying to cut out a very specific problem, we're going to cut a very narrow range of frequencies. The EQ that usually has a Q adjustment in it is called a parametric EQ that allows us to change the frequency, the amount of cut or boost, and the width of the cut or boost. So what do you think we would do to uh, thicken a female voice? Is thickening an improvement or an enhancement? Well, let's take a look. How'd you do? Did you say thickening was an enhancement? Did you choose 150 hertz as your center frequency or something in that range? Here we're not suggesting a Q, so we're assuming that you're probably making this adjustment on one of the regular equalizers where you cannot adjust the Q. In other words, the width is going to be the width of one of those sliders, which is either 1 10th or 1 31st of the spectrum. Now, how would we go about increasing vocal presence? Presence sounds like a little higher frequency to me, perhaps intended to enhance articulation as well as overall presence. What adjustment do you recommend? Presence refers to opening up the sound and making it more, well, present. 
It's like adding air to an acoustic guitar in a sense, but for the voice. So in a voice, the higher end of the range is about five kilohertz. So we can try two to four decibels uh, to see what sounds good. Let's try one more. How would you go about improving the voice by reducing sibilance issues? What sound is sibilance? What frequency would you expect it to center on? What should we do at that frequency? Well, the frequency of sibilance, or essiness, varies widely from male to female, child to adult, and based on other factors. It will usually be in the 4 to 8 kilohertz range, and we're fixing an issue here, so we're cutting, not boosting. So take a filter or EQ band in the 4 to 8 kilohertz range, cut it by 12 dB or so, then sweep the center frequency to find the fix. Reduce the cut to a smaller amount once you find the frequency. There's no precise recipe for DSing. Use your ears and find what works without sounding odd. Alternatively, try the DSer effect and choose a preset that fits your source as a starting point. Now let's look at the rest of the starting recipes. These are good, rem good to remember as starting points and for quick enhancements and improvements. In video, much of what we do has to do with the spoken word, so I focused on voice examples here, although muddiness and honkiness are more general. Your ears are a critical tool for good audio, but sometimes it helps to be able to see what you're hearing. Waveforms are handy for seeing timing, of course, in addition to spotting peaks and other issues. When we need to see more, we use the meters. Those larger meters let us see their sound levels more clearly than the little tiny ones in the center of the screen. And when we need to see even more, we use the analyzer in those logic EQs we looked at earlier to watch our sound across the frequency spectrum, which can help us hone in on a needed EQ or multipressor adjustment that our ears may be having a hard time identifying. We've covered some basic theory and fundamentals, we've talked about principles I try to follow for good audio for my video projects, and we've gone over microphones and some specific features in Final Cut Pro 10. Now let's share some other tips and tricks. I've brought several, and I hope you have some of your own that you can share with each other. When you're trying to time cuts to music, one method is to play the clip and drop a marker on each beat based on hearing and feeling the rhythm. For decision making, it is good to know the tempo or beats per minute of the music. Logic Pro has a detect tempo feature, or you can just try to count it. There are also third party plugins that can detect beats per minute. I do this extensively when making video slideshows where I want to change photos on the beat, or when making music videos where I want to cut on the beat. Knowing the tempo helps me decide how many images and how long to display each, as well as helping me figure out what beats to change on. Sometimes you need to cut more than the EQ seems to allow, or vice versa. You can lower the EQ's gain setting and then raise the good frequencies while cutting the bad frequencies to effectively get more range. Be careful though, as this can lead to very unnatural sounding audio if overdone. I know I've said this before, but probably my best tip or trick is to prevent, prevent, prevent. It is easier than fix, 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 and sounds better. For example, close mic your spoken voice whenever possible. Sometimes it feels like you're getting in the way when it is time to set up the mic or go over important directing advice. Generally, the talent wants to look and sound as good as possible and knows that is why you're taking their time. You can actually say so if necessary. A polite professional, Hi, my name is Scott. My job is to make sure you look and sound great on camera. I just need a few minutes to get the mic positioned and share a few pointers can go a long way. Don't forget to record some room tone when all else is quiet. You'll thank me later. You have multiple uses for this magical audio clip. Make it long enough to avoid having to loop or piece together a layer under an overdub. Try to scout the room under similar conditions to your production. Is the heating or cooling equipment running? What kind of noise challenge does it create? When you're trying to diagnose a problem frequency, don't be subtle and try to sneak up on it. Exaggerate the cut or boost enough to hear if you're in the right place. When you know you're working on the right frequency, then you can get subtle about it. This advice is good for post-production, not necessarily live sound reinforcement, unless you have the opportunity to do it during the sound check beforehand. I mentioned this earlier, digital SLRs make great video. They have large sensors, shallow depth of field, high quality lenses, they're good in lower light. 
Um, and they, but they generally have marginal audio preamps and processing. They also have louder lenses when it comes to things like autofocus. Capturing a sync track in camera to make your life easier, but using an external microphone and recorder for the production grade audio capture will give you a better result. Camcorders are better, but not by a ton. Consider dual recording with camcorders too. Even if you capture in camera, consider external microphones and possibly external microphone preamps. We talked a bit about using multicam mode to sync clips earlier. Final Cut Pro also has a basic sync capability just to line up an audio clip with a video clip if they both have the same soundtrack. There are also external tools like Red Giant's Pluralize, which can sync audio for more than one video editing tool. Know your sources. Don't go film a classical performance if you've never even listened to classical music. If possible, listen to the actual pieces they will be performing. If not, listen to something from the same composer or era at least. Get an idea for the dynamic range, the characteristics of the different movements, whether there are quiet solo instruments that you need to worry about. Do some location scouting and discuss the specifics of the performance with the conductor in advance so you can plan your production. I mentioned golden ears earlier. If you really want to know what you're hearing and be effective and efficient at mixing and editing, editing audio, this is a great course. Great audio for video or otherwise is a mix of art, science, and skill. Knowing the software tools, being familiar with the sources, having a vision for the finished production, and having ears that enable you to achieve the vision is a winning formula. So I'm going to leave you with a few concepts that you can use to review uh, what we've been talking about. What's a key habit that will help prevent accidentally capturing video without audio? Hopefully headphones came to mind. You want to be listening, not just looking at the meters. By the way, turning on the meters and watching them is a good habit too. Here's a few more. I'm not going to give you the answers to the rest of these. I'm going to let you go away and think about them. What's the first thing to check or try when you hear 60 hertz hum? What setup will you choose to record a 10-person choir when you can only capture two channels of audio? You're covering an event where six different people will speak at a podium, some for only a minute or two. How do you mic the presenters? Finally, how can you help ensure that cables work when you need them? Thanks for your attention today. I expect that some of what we covered was review for some people, but I also expect that what was review for one person may not have been the same thing that was review for another person. You can help each other by sharing your experiences. In the end, I hope that everyone learned something and that we all now have a better foundation for good audio for our video. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.